All right. Our um, next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Nahua Duan, and he's a, a biostatistician at Columbia University in the psychiatry department. And he's, uh, he's told me that uh, in, in two weeks he's going to be retiring. Uh, enjoying us. Uh, maybe uh, I was hoping to be uh, involved in some research as a hobby. Uh, Thanks very much to the organization committee for organizing this very uh, stimulating uh, symposium. Also, thanks to you for staying uh, to this late afternoon session. So uh, this work I'm presenting is a joint work with uh, Richard Kravitz at UC Davis, and uh, part of the work uh, was uh, supported with funding from uh, Pfizer. And uh, the nature of the presentation is uh, this is work in progress, and I will be talking about the conceptual development and a couple of pilot studies that we have completed and some outlooks for the future of this research agenda. Okay, a brief outline. So well know there's a large gap between research and practice, and uh, we believe there's a need for engagement of frontline pr uh, practitioners uh, to take a more active role uh, into learning uh, communities. And uh, we illustrate with two examples, uh, N of N trials for learning from within patient uh, experience, and also uh, what we call evidence farming for learning uh, across uh, uh, patients uh, within uh, specific sites to help inform clinical decision making. And uh, uh, if time allows, I will talk briefly about empirical-based methods to combine knowledge across patients and across sites. Okay, so the gap between research and practice. Uh, routine practice is often hazardous, and uh, the process by which uh, the, the learning from uh, experience occurs is very often uh, follows uh, ad hoc try and error. And uh, the research knowledge is usually produced uh, centrally, uh, and the relevance of the research knowledge might not be compelling to the practitioners on the front line, and therefore uh, the uptake of this, uh, uh, this knowledge has not been uh, has been suboptimal. So, with the disconnect between the research and practice, there has been uh, a missed opportunity to learn more systematically from the local practice experience. Uh, so, this uh, prompts us to think that maybe we should uh, take another look at how the uh, clinical knowledge enterprise is uh, organized. Okay, so the prevailing uh, organization uh, is a top-down model where uh, the generalizable knowledge is produced uh, centrally and then disseminated to the front line uh, for adoption implementation and uh, the role of the frontline providers is a relatively passive one. And uh, there might not be a totally uh, desirable uh, arrange, uh, organization. So uh, we believe there's a potential that uh, a more effective uh, approach might be a two-way uh, organization uh, in which uh, information from the uh, local practical experience is also uh, uh, harvested into uh, uh, useful knowledge that could be used to help inform uh, uh, clinical decision making. So as an analogy, uh, we thought that this model might be uh, like the auto titration of CPAP device that is uh, often used to treat uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, the device pumps a small air pressure into the airway to avoid or mitigate uh, sleep uh, apnea. And uh, some of the devices uh, deliver a fixed pressure, and some of the devices have this uh, learning mechanism. So uh, the holes on the right-hand side, uh, let me see if I can get the mouse out, uh, has an interesting uh, inner tube that is a sensor tube to uh, monitor the uh, the condition of the patient, and then feedback to the central device 
and to adjust the pressure. So the way the device operates is uh, it starts at a relatively low pressure, and then as the sensor begins to detect sleep apnea or hypopnea, uh, it increases the pressure uh, slowly up to the point where uh, the apnea is uh, under control, and then it might gradually uh, reduce the pressure. So the, the uh, delivery of the uh, treatment is uh, uh, adjusted automatically based on the information collected locally. So with thinking about that as a model, uh, we believe that might be something useful to think about for the, uh, uh, the broader uh, the, the healthcare uh, the delivery system. So it is conceivable that maybe some frontline provider might uh, not want to be limited to a passive role of uh, studying the guidelines and studying the information uh, uh, disseminated to them. But it is conceivable that uh, there might be an interest in taking a more active role and uh, to uh, produce uh, local knowledge from the clinical experience within the specific practice and then use that to supplement the generalized knowledge uh, obtained from the top-down channel uh, to help us maybe uh, calibrate or adapt the treatment, de uh, treatment delivery. Uh, so such a model, we believe, uh, has the potential to engage the frontline uh, uh, practitioner into uh, learning communities. And uh, it might also uh, motivate uh, the more active uh, data acquisition, because if the data is being collected for the purpose of delivering to the, uh, uh, the, the, the Columbia University and is never seen again, uh, there's not a really compelling uh, incentive for the practitioners to make a good effort to collect outcomes data, and that is very often the challenge that we see in comparative academic research. But if the data is collected, uh, could be used for a local purpose for the practitioner's own use, then potentially there will be a stronger incentive to uh, provide that data. Uh, so, uh, it is, uh, and then the empirical based methods can also be used to provide the synthesis between the local data and the, uh, the aggregate data to uh, provide this uh, two way uh, interface. So, in a sense, what we're proposing here is uh, a system level uh, CER where uh, the two uh, different organizations potentially could be compared and uh, evaluated to uh, understand whether a two-way uh, process might uh, lead to, to better uh, outcomes. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, the, the model we're proposing here is uh, similar to what has been known in recent years in the literature as the uh, uh, medical-based evidence, or sometimes called uh, practice-based evidence, and uh, here are some of the uh, recent uh, key publications. And uh, to note that uh, 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 Susan Horn and uh, uh, Julia Gasowin uh, gave a presentation at this symposium uh, several years ago on their work on practice-based evidence that was published in Medical Care in 2007. Uh, so our work builds on the previous work, but uh, I think what is uh, distinguished our work from the previous work, uh, I think there's probably two dimensions. One important dimension is that most of the previous uh, uh, work on MBE or PBE uh, is primarily focused on using observational data. And uh, our proposition is that uh, uh, MBE or PBE or locally produced uh, knowledge does not have to rely entirely on observational uh, data. And we should not overlook the opportunities that uh, a local innovation or uh, experimentation potentially could be informative. And uh, we'll talk about a couple of ideas that uh, we believe are uh, pragmatic uh, options that potentially could be uh, uh, 
uh, promulgated in local practices. And I think another dimension where we believe our, our work uh, expands upon previous work is that the previous work in this area mostly uh, was focused on uh, using the practice data to produce generalizable knowledge for, uh, I guess, universal application. And our focus is to emphasize on the, to recognize the possibility of the heterogeneity of treatment of fact that uh, Sorin commented on us yesterday as one of the 11 high priority topics for us PCORI. And uh, if the uh, treatment effect can be heterogeneous, that means the same treatment might not work the same way across different patients, uh, then there is a value to try to uh, look at uh, local information, to look at specific patient, how the patient responds to the treatment, or to look at a specific practice, to look to see how the patients in the specific practice responds to the treatment. Uh, so we'll talk about the first example that uh, we're proposing to, to uh, apply this uh, methodology. So to learn from within patients, a promising uh, paradigm is to conduct N of one trials. So those are multiple crossover trials uh, within a single patient. And uh, I guess the procedure is uh, to assign time intervals to the treatment, uh, say treatment A, treatment A, the treatment B options, and then maybe switch over several multiple times, and then compare the outcomes uh, for the alternative treatments uh, to see which uh, treatment option produces better outcome for that specific patient. And the treatment uh, the assignment, uh, so it's not across patients, but it's within patient and uh, assigned at the unit of time intervals, say, uh, weeks. Uh, So the assignment can be randomized and can be blinded when appropriate, but it does not have to be. And so the focus here is on producing the local knowledge specific to the patient to try to resolve uh, whether uh, treatment A or treatment B is better for the specific patient. And uh, so as to inform the decision for that patient. So. Uh, the indications where this uh, procedure might be appropriate uh, include uh, should be ongoing treatment for chronic conditions such as uh, pain management, uh, and uh, especially in situations where uh, many older patients might have multiple chronic conditions, and it is really diff uh, a very difficult area to study because there are so many possible combinations, and uh, uh, it's uh, very difficult to do the parallel group trials and uh, I think even with a uh, uh, large database, uh, the combination of patients with multiple conditions might be so large, and this might be uh, one possible way to inform specific patients about the treatment options that uh, might be uh, useful. And uh, another requirement is that the treatment uh, has ne uh, negligible carryover effect. Uh, so this is not for surgery once you cut off the uh, uh, the, uh, the, the part, uh, there, there's no more, no more uh, uh, switch over that can be made. And uh, this is useful when there is uh, uncertainty about the therapeutic effects, and uh, especially when the effect is potentially heterogeneous. So uh, to back to the point I talked about earlier, so I think that on the broader framework, uh, we're proposing a system level CER to compare uh, the use of this learning uh, model versus a one-way dissemination model to uh, inform clinical decision uh, at a system level. But then at a micro level, within uh, a single patient, uh, this is a, a micro level CER for each individual patient to try to inform the decision making for that individual patient. And uh, uh, I think as uh, we discussed yesterday, I think this is also uh, an important part of the goals for PICO. Okay. So 
So we published a uh, literature review uh, last year on the N1 trials that have been published in the medical literature uh, since 85 when the field uh, about started. And we identified about 100 articles uh, that includes 108 protocols and a little over 2,000 patients. Uh, so most of the, uh, those trials are randomized and blinded. And uh, the decision rule and stopping rule for those trials are varied. And uh, uh, more than half of the trial, to our surprise, uh, came to a conclusion uh, without any statistical analysis uh, it was reported. Uh, the, the decision was based on visual or graphical uh, com comparison. Uh, and then there are about half of the studies that reported t-test and uh, with various uh, methodologies. Some use 5% significance, 10%, 20%. And this is an area that we definitely believe, uh, well, we believe this is a pro promising paradigm. At the same time, uh, further methodological development is definitely warranted. And uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Schmidt, who presented earlier this morning, uh, is one of the biostatisticians who has been leading uh, a good uh, methodology development, like empirical-based methods in this area. Uh, despite those limitations in the current methodology, the findings of those trials, uh, right or wrong, uh, were influential in uh, the subsequent treatment decision. So among the patients for whom the trial finding favored the initial treatment, 95% of them stayed with that treatment. And among the patients whose trial uh, finding favored alternative treatment, 84% uh, of them uh, followed that uh, finding. So those are influential uh, 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 trials, but uh, I guess the methodology uh, needs more work to be further developed. Uh, we did a pilot study on the acceptability of this uh, methodology that was published a couple of years ago. We interviewed 21 physicians and 32 patients. Uh, so some of the findings were encouraging. Uh, the clinician made a, one of the clinicians made a very nice point that what well, it puts a little structure into the idea. Why don't we try this medicine and see how it goes? So the usual practice is try and error, and this is to make the trial and error more systematic and try to do it more rigorously. And uh, some patients made very keen observations. Like us, uh, it will show which one's better for you personally, rather which one's better for this group. Uh, and then you take the two different things yourself, and you don't have to compare yourself to somebody else. The patient recognizes she is being used as her own control that uh, increases the credibility of the finding to her. And uh, so there's also recognition among the uh, physicians in our survey that this is potentially an important game changer that cuts both ways. On the one side, uh, this, uh, they recognize this can help enhance communication with the patient and maybe encourage better uh, physician-patient relationship. On the other hand, uh, some of physicians were also very concerned that their procedures of uh, uh, authority over the patient will be compromised because they will help to tell patient, I don't really know which uh, treatment is better for you. Let's try it out. Uh, okay, so we believe uh, this is a useful uh, methodology to inform a personalized treatment decision for individual patients to improve therapeutic uh, precision and uh, having the same patient serve as home earth control and a systematic application of the common practice. So what we're advocating here is that this is not to try to import a foreign and a, a very a, 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 a difficult RCT into practice, but this is something that is the good practitioners are already doing, but in a not systematic way. But this might be a way to try to elevate that uh, usual practice into something that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's more informative. So uh, as our pilot study showed, uh, we believe this is potentially uh, uh, acceptable to a number of practitioners. And uh, this will potentially uh, benefit from developments in, in information technology, and our research group uh, is in the process of applying for a grant to uh, develop the infrastructure support 
for the uh, M1 tri system uh, through a mobile health application. And there's a subtle question whether this should be considered as a quality improvement clinical practice or human subjects research uh, under the uh, IRB purview. And uh, uh, some of our collaborators, like uh, Dr. Sunita Vola at University of uh, Alberta, were able to uh, convince the IRB this is real practice, uh, clinical practice, quality improvement, so they would uh, receive expedited review. And further method development, uh, we hope that we will be able to uh, uh, work on in the future. Uh, thanks, much. So I think I will skip the other section. All right, thank you. Um, all right, uh, so we'd like to uh, move on to the uh, final presentation for today, and this is um, Jason Connor, who will talk about um, a Bayesian adaptive trial design in comparative effectiveness research and um, furthering the, um, the, uh, the theme of diverse healthcare interventions. Uh, the, the intervention in this case is uh, method, uh, interventions for status epilepticus. Right. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for the organizers to in, for inviting me here. I know it's been a long day. My topic is probably maybe the easiest to follow, so, so someone was good to put me last for that reason. So I, living in the clinical trial world, I think I get to answer interesting problems, but they're probably not as challenging as many of the, the really, really hard ones that uh, you know we've heard about using observational data that come with all sorts of complexity. So. So I have some benefits, but I'm going to talk about a Bayesian adaptive trial in staticus epilepticus, which is basically uh, having seizures and some different types of seizures. So my conflicts, I'm going to talk about three drugs here. All three are generically available. I frankly don't even know who makes them. I'm not working for the drug companies here. I do work for a bunch of drug and device companies, but not any that I'll be talking to you about. Um, so this is part of, uh, I work with a group that got a grant called ADAPTIT. Uh, which is the, the Neurologic Emergency Treatment Trials Network, a group of emergency physicians doing neurological outcome trials like stroke and such. Uh, we got this grant to redesign uh, essentially these emergency room trials using Bayesian adaptive methods. And the one particular one I'm going to talk about is ESET, which is uh, this status epileptic treatment trial uh, that we're putting together with a bunch of neurologists. So uh, a whole bunch of collaborators contributed to this work. In particular, uh, Jadeep Kapoor is the PI of ESET. Jordan Elm is the, the head statistician at the, the group that will be collecting the data, everything, and Christine Brolio is one of my colleagues at Barry Consultants with whom I'm doing this. So our, our research question is basically patients come in, they have a seizure, they come into the hospital. Pretty much everyone gets benzodiazepines first, but in some patients benzodiazepines don't work, and then what? Well, currently patients get one of these three drugs. So phosphatidone is actually approved for this, uh, the other two drugs aren't approved for this, but it's not even clear which of these three drugs works best. Uh, so, you know, all of these are commercially available for other things. They're being used off-label here. So this would be an NIH-sponsored trial to figure out which of these works best. So it's a true comparative effectiveness study in that way. You know, which of these things should we be doing? And, you know, there are differences that I won't get into a whole lot about pediatric versus adult populations and even senior populations. Uh, so the endpoint here is a composite endpoint. Can we make your seizure go away rapidly within 20 minutes? Uh, can we make it so that you don't seize again, so we don't need to give you more medicine in the next two hours? And is there no significant adverse event? So we're, we're including efficacy and safety in a pretty simple dichotomous outcome. Uh, and the good thing about this outcome, one of the things about Bayesian adaptive trials is they work best if there's a rapid you know, time to endpoint versus accrual rate. If I have a 12-month outcome but can enroll everyone in three months, I can't help you much as a Bayesian adaptive trial designer. So we have a fast endpoint here. So this is a prime place uh, for an adaptive trial. And this is comparative effectiveness. So most of what I do is actually for FDA. Drug companies or device companies come to me to, to help them, you know, get something FDA approved. And so, you know, there's differences in those sorts of trials. One key one is type 1 error means a lot different in comparative effectiveness. If I have a new cancer drug and I make a type 1 error, that means we approve something that, in fact, doesn't work. So we're giving someone a drug that has, you know, adverse event profiles and costs money and isn't doing them any good. In comparative effect, and this type 1 errors probably aren't as bad, right? I mean, if I'm a manager of a baseball team and I have two people who are equally good hitters, it doesn't matter if I erroneously declare one is better than the other. Uh, you know, if they're equally good, it doesn't matter, you know, which one of those two I pick. Uh, that said, we're still going to think hard about type 1 error and control it, but, you know, it's worth thinking a little differently in comparative effectiveness. And what do I really want to know? Well, I really want to know what drug is best. 
uh, and, and how certain am I that that's true? One of the things we'll talk about is stopping trials for futility. I hope the alarm does not imply that my talk should stop for futility here. Um, if someone back there smells smoke, let me know. We'll all leave. Uh, so, you know, comparative effectiveness trials, right? We, we've all done our own comparative effectiveness trials. So I live in Orlando. Uh, there's a relatively new medical school in Orlando. It's down here by the airport. Uh, there's not a whole lot of cool places to live in Orlando. So let's say we, you move to Orlando and you live up here in one of the cool places. So the question is, how do you get to work, right? So you can go down and over on the highway. You can go over and down on the highway. Or you can kind of take surface roads and get to work. So, you know, you've all moved to a new city and started a new job, and you've had to figure out, how do I get to work? Um, so, you know, what you do is, if you're not a statistician, many of you are, if you're not a statistician, you seek out a statistician, and you say, help me figure out <laughs> how to get to work. And, and he asks questions like, well, What's a clinically significant difference? And you say five minutes. Like, if it's four minutes, I'm going to go the prettiest way. If it's six minutes, I'm going to go, you know, the fastest way. And he says, okay, what's the standard deviation? And he said, I knew you were going to ask that. I have pilot data, seven minutes. Um, so, and then he does some calculations, and he says, if you go each way 40 times, you'll have a 90% chance of identifying the best one. So here are these envelopes. Every morning when you have your coffee, rip open an envelope, go that way, Email me how long, and in 120 days from now, about six months, I'll tell you how to get to work from now on. Um, so I know that's how all of you choose how to get to work. Blinding? How does the blinding work out? Like and, and it's hard to do here. Yeah. <laughs> not, not blinded. Uh, the, the DSMB would not approve the blinded study. Right, so, so you know, we understand that, you know, certainly trials and randomization, all that's good. I firmly believe that. But the idea of fixed trials, it's worth to me thinking about, well, what's a better way to do this? So how, how, of course, do we do this? Well, you try one way, you try a different way, and you get a sense for what's better, and you stop going the bad ways, right? And there might be, you know, a day where it's not too busy a day, you don't have early meetings, and so you go the way that you've kind of not been going for a while. And either you go, oh, this way is faster than I thought, I'm going to try it again someday soon, or you go, oh, now I know why I never go this way. Um, and so you, you never go that way again. Um, so it's the same thing here, but, you know, why do we do trials? Because we understand error rates. We understand type 1 error. We understand power. You know, I'm a Bayesian, but I'm a firm believer in understanding type 1 error. Uh, so that, that is important. So, but we can combine these two things, right? We can do something adaptive, pick the best way to go, learn as we go, try to figure out the answer faster. But at the same time, as long as we pre-specify everything, we can come up with those error rates that we want to know. And generally, that's kind of why we do fixed trials, because it's easy to calculate error rates. But we can do something adaptive now and still calculate error rates. Um, so the trial I'm going to talk about here um, that we want to adaptively allocate to favor better treatments, that's going to help patients, but it's also going to help us as statisticians. If at the end of the trial you put a patient on essentially the worst arm, that patient isn't telling you any information about identifying, you know, what's the best arm, because it's still one of the, the two other arms left. Uh, we want to drop arms that are performing poorly. Again, that'll help patients, and it also then we can reapply those patients to arms that we still care about. And we're going to stop early if we know the answer. So how does adaptive allocation work? So here, we're just, uh, oh, I, I didn't say at the beginning. So we basically, like all trials, right, the maximum sample size is kind of determined by resources. It's not really determined by what the statistician says. So there's about, um, yeah, yeah, you'd laugh. You know that's true, right? We all know that's true. Um, I, I, yeah, anyway, so there's about eight, there's 795 patients uh, in this study, and that was a bit of negotiation between what was feasible and what statisticians said. So a total of 795 patients, but after 300, we'll, we'll kick in adaptive randomization here, and then after every additional 100 patients. And, and part of this, because this is an emergency room setting, there isn't, you know, there's just going to be a bag on top. So there's going to be three stacks of bags where each bag is a drug, and there's going to be like the pediatric, the middle aged and old people. Uh, and when someone comes in, you grab the bag on top. So there's no sort of IVRS or anything like that. Um, so we didn't want to update randomization probabilities too often because updating randomization probabilities actually meant someone had to go in and reshuffle bags, and there's, there's place for human error in this. We wanted to minimize that. So we're only updating randomization probabilities every 100 patients, starting when 300 patients are, are randomized. So we're going to favor uh, treatments that do better, favor treatments with greater uncertainty, um, and, and basically what that means is, so we have two, let's say, you know, two treatments, one's doing better than the other, uh, so we randomize more to the, the better one. 
and then it does not as good, and the next time the other one catches up. So now they're doing equally as good again, but I have a higher end on one than the other. So in the next round, I'll favor the one with, with the fewer patients to kind of try to let it catch up. So we're favoring better patient or better treatments and treatments with greater uncertainty in the parameter estimate. Uh, and updating every 100 patients is about every six months. Uh, if the, the probability of allocation ever is less than 5%, I'm just going to round that to zero and reallocate between my two arms. And if the probability of success is ever bigger, the, the, if the probability of success rate is bigger than 25% is ever less than 5%, I'm just going to drop that arm for good and never go back to it. Um, so that's my adaptive allocation, and there's, of course, equations here that nobody wants to see at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so early stopping at 400 patients, we start the possibility of early stopping. And again, every 100 patients, uh, we, we re-examine that. So if ever one particular arm has a 97.5% chance that it's the best arm, meaning that, that it's the probability of being the highest success rate is higher than the other two arms, we stop and declare it the winner. Um, and for futility, rather than looking at something like just a plain p bat value, what we calculate is we, we take our current data and calculate the predictive probability of successes. If I keep going all the way up to 795 patients, which is my maximum, what's the probability I identify a best or a worst drug? If that probability is ever less than 5%, I, I stop my trial for futility. Um, and we also talked about arm dropping. If we drop all three arms, of course, the trial stops for futility here too. So one interesting thing, remember I said we, we start adaptive randomization at 300, but we start early stopping at 400. Uh, one reason we do that is to uh, lower type 1 error. So what happens if we would have started them both at the same time is that if one arm, even let's say all three drugs are com uh, completely equally effective, if we just see you know, a random high and we allowed early stopping and adaptive randomization to start all at once, we might make a type 1 error and declare this drug's better. Here, if one drug is doing way better than the others at the first analysis, we won't stop early yet. We'll instead adaptively randomize, and almost all patients will go on to that drug. And if, in fact, it was a random high, probably what will happen is we get regression to the mean in that next 100 patients. So if you start early stopping after you start adaptive randomization, you tend to get lower type 1 error rates. Um, so that's one reason for that. So I'm going to show you what the data would look like at the end first. So this is a trial that we're pretty much done designing right now and we'll submit. So this is example data. So here are the three drugs, and we show success rates like this has 65 out of 126 observed, and VPA has 194 out of 298. And notice the success rates here, it's 69%, here it's 58, here it's 52. These are posterior probabilities, and it's narrower for VPA because that's because the best drug had the most patients randomized to it. You know, we essentially didn't randomize nearly as many patients to this, uh, which is good for patients. But, you know, we're still near, you know, pretty certain that this drug is better than this drug. So, so most patients went on this, and our precision of the drug we care most about is also smaller. Uh, and because we're doing this in a Bayesian world, we can calculate things like the probability each is the best drug and the worst drug and, and all sorts of pairwise comparisons. So just to, to demonstrate how this would work. So at a first analysis of 300 patients, we've equally randomized. And of course, in a real trial, these wouldn't be exactly 100 probably. But we can see that, that uh, valproic acid was doing the best here. Uh, the probability each of these three is the best is you know, 3, 9, and 88%. And there's an equation behind how we update our randomization probability. Some trials just use the probability each is best. We attenuate that in a way, but we still randomize instead of one-third, we essentially randomize two-thirds of all patients to BPA for the next 100 patients. So we do that, and in fact, we see in the next 100 patients it wasn't the best, just out of the next 100, that uh, LVT was the best. Still, overall, it's not as good, but the treatment effect isn't as dramatic. Here it was 9%, now it's just 5%. Uh, and, and we randomize patients still favoring BPA quite a bit, and we're randomizing you know, very few patients now to Bosphenitoin, a few. Uh, and we, we calculate now our predictive probability of success if we keep going to the end. So there's a 50% chance that by the end of the trial, we identify one drug as either the best or the worst. We randomize the next 100 patients according to these randomization probabilities. And when we do, we, in fact, see the drug that looked the best is still doing the best in our new wave. Uh, and, and so this got bigger again. So now we're randomizing 70% you know, of new patients to valproic acid. 
And remember, if this, this number has to be 97.5 to stop. So we almost hit a stopping point. If that number had been 97.5, we would have stopped and declared valproic acid the best. Uh, and in our next wave, we see, in fact, 80% of the next uh, 70 approximately patients that got randomized to it were treatment successes, and it, it's now pretty evident that there's a 99.2% chance that valproic acid is the best of these three treatments. So the trial would stop early for uh, success here, and we could go and publish. And so the idea here in this example, you know, is that we're learning as we go. We're updating randomization probabilities, and, and we're treating patients better, but also learning rapidly. And then this would be the final analysis that I already showed you. So that's one example, but the key is, well, how does, how does this work on average? Or, you know, how do we actually expect this to work? So we can simulate this in numerous scenarios. So we have, you know, our null case where each of these drugs works half the time, a good case where one is 15% better than the other, one where one drug is just 15% worse than the other two, one where there's, you know, sort of a linear effect here, and one where there's all really bad. So in the, in the null case here, on average, we have 545 patients. Remember, it could go up to 795. So these tend to stop early because the trial is realizing, oh, even if I expend all my resources, it's improbable that I identify either a drug that's better or worse than the other two. Uh, the probability that I, that I identify one is the best is just 0.02. So this is our type 1 error rate here. Uh, so that's low. That's good. Uh, and the probability you get randomized to the best treatment is 100%. All three of these drugs are equally effective, so everyone gets the best drug. Uh, when one is good, so when one is 15% better than the other, uh, our, our mean number of patients is pretty low. We tend to stop you know, at just the second possible interim analysis here at 500 patients. Uh, the probability we identify the best drug in this case is 94%. That's our power, so our power is really high. In fact, 89% of the time we do that early. 5% of the time it happens at the 795 patient analysis. And here the probability you're randomized to the best patient is 48%. So in a typical fixed trial, all patients would get, have a one-third chance of getting the best drug. And here there's, in fact, a 48% chance. So more patients are getting better treatment. And in fact, this, of course, means that for the first 300 patients, everyone's getting a third. So if you're in the latter group of patients, there's a very, very good chance you're getting the, the better treatment here. And we can see this for other ones. So these are operating characteristics we look at to ensure that, you know, the trial is doing smart things. And, of course, you can, you know, change some of our, you know, the, the way you choose to randomly or update randomization probabilities. There's some of the cutoff bounds for early stopping and re-simulate. And, and we did that many times. And, you know, much thought and trial and error sort of went into the, the bounds that we chose to operate the trial and these operating characteristics. Uh, so just to summarize here is that comparative effectiveness, which is the focus here, is really an ideal setting for Bayesian adaptive trials to learn as we go to ensure that patients within the trial are getting treated well and we're not giving, you know, especially patients at the end of the trial, treatments that the DMC may know are probably treatments they shouldn't be getting, but no one else knows that. Uh, that it's okay then to do interim analyses early and often. I mean, we live in a world, right, where I can go on my phone and look at soccer scores from the Euro Cup right now, essentially real time. Uh, so, you know, it should be possible that a patient that had a seizure, you know, three hours ago in Seattle who got treated and who was doing well, that that can hit, you know, our database so that when a patient comes in, you know, tomorrow in Miami, maybe they can reflect that. Uh, you know, that, that, that's not an impossible thing given the, the IT infrastructure that is just, you know, the world that we live in. Uh, that we can steer patients away from poor therapies and stop trials as soon as we know which one is better. And that, to me, anyway, this is just really a more natural way that we all make decisions, and so it's a natural way to design clinical trials. So, thanks. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to invite all of the uh, discussants in today's um, uh, last session to come up and uh, then you have uh, open for general questions. Sebastian Schriebers, maybe I start um, uh, seeing Jennifer and, um, and, and Jason sitting next to each other. I, mean, I, I see lots of parallels here between adaptive uh, trial design as, and, and um, um, drug safety um, monitoring strategies, right, like the mini Sentinel. Um, can, can you make the link here, um, make it more explicit?
Yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing. And I think what's important to do in the drug safety setting is to think about what are the important operating characteristics. So the ones that Jason showed were very relevant to the decisions that need to be made in that setting and the tra recognizing the trade-offs between the cost of the false positive, the cost of the false, ne false negative, which are different in a safety setting. And so I think it, what I heard, which is useful for places like Mini Central will be thinking about is careful thought in terms of operating characteristics, careful planning in advance about when, when do we want to signal and how then do we define the thresholds on which we'll signal, how often should we look, and that there hasn't been that much or, or enough discussion about these issues. And I think um, thinking about it in a systematic framework like you presented is really important. And it's, it's a good question. It's a hard question. And, you know, one of the outcomes here is significant adverse event. But, of course, as the designer, you have to decide, you know, what is significant. And there might be something that, you know, like with FenFen, -Fen, no one saw heart valve damage coming, and it wouldn't have been included in an adaptive design, of course. Uh, so, you know, a DMC always has a role there. Uh, but at the same time, you know, including those to the extent you can is good. We had a lot of discussion. There's the, the NET that I mentioned, which is a neurologic emergency treatment trials network uh, is doing this. There's a group called PCARN, which is a similar thing in kids. So we're using both of these existing networks. And the, the PCARN people had a big concern that essentially the drug that worked best in adults wouldn't be the best in kids. And so we're adaptively randomizing, and over half of these people are adults. So are we adaptively randomizing to children what might not really be the best in children? And so we thought about splitting them and making all these rules. And, uh, you know, we ended up just that the DMC basically can look and the DMC can flip a switch that makes it flat randomization for children and shuts it off. We, we have no reason to expect that it will be different in kids, uh, including the safety profile. But, you know, that's one of the things we had to think about and include. But, right, so including, you know, multiple outcomes is really great and including utility functions. But it's still tricky that with safety we're never exactly, you know, sometimes we're sure. Someone mentioned claudication. I was on a claudication DMC where we did something adaptive because you know what to expect in claudication in some ways. Uh, but in a lot of things, you don't even know what to expect with safety profiles. So it does make things pretty hard. I think the other point, too, in randomized versus not randomized settings is the emphasis that one should put on things like type 1 error versus bias due to confounding. I mean, we all do sensitivity analyses that try to capture how wrong we could go if we make different assumptions about, about things and, and misclassification of our data or confounding. And so I think taking into account the statistical variation is important, but I think there, it would be good to have more emphasis on looking at different sources of bias as well in terms of thinking about where to set those stopping boundaries. Uh, this is Bruce Farman. One, one uh, issue um, that might come up in both the safety and that I was thinking about in your context is uh, when do you stop? And I guess w for futility in your context, uh, I suppose you were saying there's very little value in reducing the uncertainty and that there's no difference among these three. If you start out, you know, with a lot of uncertainty, if you kept going, you know, you would be able to conclude um, you know, with more uh, confidence that um, that they were all pretty much the same, but you decide that's not worth doing, and that's not and and that's futility, probably based on your sponsor's concerns or whatever. But uh, there's a similar thing in safety uh, where we're always wondering about signaling and all that, but there's also some value in uh, narrowing, uh, you know, if it's safe and getting more and more a narrower and narrower confidence interval around your null hypothesis. So I'm just wondering how you. Uh, I, what was the rationale for calling it uh, futile when you knew that by the end you weren't going to be able to rule in favor of one? Right. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So there's sort of, I heard two in there. One is, you know, I've heard a lot of people say we should stop trials early for futility, but we shouldn't stop trials early for success because we always want as much information as we can about safety. You know, and that's, you know, a tough question. If I'm someone prone to seizures, maybe I want to know this information as soon as possible so that my doc can treat me the best, right? Um, so I think that's a tough one. It probably depends on the clinical setting. Uh, in terms of futility stopping rules, yeah, here, since this is, you know, in the FDA setting, if Johnson & Johnson knows they're not going to be statistically significant, you know, even at P equals 0.09, they may as well stop because they need a trial that is to get approved. You know, it's not black and white. But here, it's totally different in comparative effectiveness. And one of the things we asked, we had our group of clinicians, and we said, okay, if at the end of the trial, it's 80% versus 10% versus 10% that each of these three is the probability of being the best. That's not a statistically significant p-value. And when we translate it to frequentist, would that change your practice pattern? Uh, and the answers were all over the board. And some said no, because it's not 
statistically significant. And some said, oh, absolutely, because you still need to pick one of the three. When one you patients need to pick in. one of the three, right. and, and even if you're never going to meet your initial criteria for calling one a winner, right. if you've got to pick one, why not pick the one that's out in front, and, and, and you'll have a better uh, notion of the lead. If it's right, and the difference was, you know, that we, we simulated that and looked at individual trials, and basically, you know, you're taking one that is, if it's sitting at a 60% chance of being the best versus, say, 20 and 20 for the other two, even if we went to the end, that was just going to be 70. And so they're still going to pick the best one. So we basically thought pretty hard about that question and realized the utility of crossing this magical bound that we all believe more than we should in, uh, apologies to the frequentists in the room, uh, you know, was really strong. And the utility of going from 60 to 70 percent in a posterior wasn't as strong, and it was worth, you know, saving NIH's resources and getting the information out of there. But, you know, I, I don't think that that's, you know, it's for sure the best way to do it, but it's, it's something we thought really hard about within the group. Bob Glenn, I have a question for Jason as well. In the setting of, of, of adaptive uh, allocation ratios, uh, are there particular concerns about the possibility that the absolute rates might be changing in the later recruited patients? As you bring on new centers in a multi-center setting, we get concerned sometimes about the, the individuals from a certain location having a different absolute event rate. And, and, and do you monitor that, and what do you think about it? Right, so that, that's a good question. That's a question I get a lot. Um, I think it, if new centers are coming on, you know, there's possibility for that. Here, fortunately, we were operating, there was just a trial published in the New England Journal two months ago in Status Epilepticus that came out of this network. So the fact that we have existing sites within our network, basically all sites turn on at the same time, which is a benefit there. Um, and, and so that's something that we've thought a lot about and basically believe that the benefit of adaptive randomization far outweighs sort of that possibility. Like we recognize it's a possibility and we frequently invite people who ask that question that if you have a trial where there's this big shift in the underlying success rate, show us. Like we would love to actually have data there, but there aren't really many examples of that. I mean, if I'm doing a breast cancer trial and I'm shifting to the treatment that looks better, suddenly Herceptin is approved and now no one that's HER2 positive gets in my trial. So I have an easier to treat population getting my experimental drug. That's a huge bias. But how often do the you know, game changers like Herceptin get approved in your indication during your trial? That's pretty rare. Um, monitor for it. Right, so during the trial, like you know, in, a, in DMC reports, we may put the underlying rate, but we also know as statisticians that there's huge variability. And even if you chunk things in three month windows, there's huge variability, even if there's no true change at all. So it, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to tell, basically, if there's really something going on. But, but we get that question a lot and, and think that it's still worth doing by the end of the trial. There's no use statistically or for a patient randomizing a patient to a drug that's not working. But it, it's always something to track and keep in mind. Hi, Carlos Blanco, Columbia University. So I wanted to ask you also, Jason, whether you can extend this methodology to um, – to treatment-resistant conditions to people who do not respond to the first treatment and then may have to, to do sequential treatment. So, for instance, if you're treating schizophrenia, people may not respond to the first antipsychotic, and then you want to try a sequence. Can you extend this methodology to, to that type of trials? Right. And so is, is the question there the idea of being adaptive within patient? So now I'm, you know, a, treat, a patient would come back, and in this case, you know, phosphatidone didn't work, so do we rent? Right. So... Um, I haven't done that. I don't know why you couldn't. It certainly gets more complicated, uh, but I think that's true in any trial like that. Uh, but, but I think you certainly could, but I personally haven't, so I don't have a good example to share. Quick, 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 quick question, Jason. I'm just wondering, I mean, I'm a health economist, not a, a biostatistician or, or an epidemiology person. Could you talk about the equipoise in this trial, and does everyone – choose to be randomized, or can they choose to have a treatment prior to, right. I mean, are, are the physicians making choices, and the people for whom they think there is equipoise, then they get randomized? And can you, if that's, if that's the case, can you talk about the implications of that relative to CER and making inferences about the results at the end? Right. So, so this, you know, and basically all the trials we're doing in this setting is interesting because patients aren't giving informed consent. You know, they're in the ER seizing. And so there's other issues that, you know, we put public service announcements on the radio, and it's sort of bizarre. Like, if you don't want to be in this trial, wear this bracelet so that if you do have a seizure, we know not to put you in the trial, which is sort of, you know, like no one, of course, 
wears those bracelets. Uh, but, but for the EMC stuff, you have to do it. I, you know, I, I, you know, so I think as a doctor, a doctor sees these patients, and if for whatever reason he would think he's not appropriate for phosphatidone, then he wouldn't put them in the trial. But I think that's sort of like most trials where if the individual doctor doesn't, or slash patient in most trials, doesn't think, doesn't have equipoise, he wouldn't put him in the trial. He'd just do what he wanted. And all three of these are available, so a doctor could choose. Unlike many trials where you couldn't actually choose between the treatments, he could here because, you know, they're all available. So, so I think it's the same situation as most trials here. That it's not different. The equipoise consideration isn't different the way you ask because it's a death. Did that first choice, that first choice get modeled in somehow? Because that, that is affecting the inferences that you can make in the long run about who gets to be randomized and who doesn't. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it, it's fair to say then that maybe at your site has a slightly different patient population than my site. If I'm a doc who favors one drug, and I think, oh, I know it'll work in this patient, so I don't put them in the trial. But, um, again, I think that's true of non-adaptive trials, too. So the answer is no, we don't model that in. Uh, and, and maybe we should, but I don't think that that has particular implication in an adaptive trial. So uh, just a quick question for Nahua. So, so the N of 1 trials, are not, they're not really a new thing, but why are they not getting adopted more in, in the healthcare system? What, what are the, the impediments? What, uh, so thanks. For, that's a very good question. So the paper that we published uh, uh, several years ago, oh, oh, I forgot to mention that in our slide, uh, there is a small bibliography of several papers, include, uh, including Chris Schmidt's uh, so very nice uh, empirical-based papers. So, so we did uh, uh, discuss the barriers on uh, the methodology. And uh, part of the important barrier is uh, the infrastructure. So for an individual practitioner, us who wants to do an one trial, you know, it's not as uh, obvious how she would do it, and so that's part of the reason why we're working to develop uh, the infrastructure through the mobile health. And another barrier that has been significant is the human subjects regulation. Although it uh, can be argued that this is really quality improvement and the clinical practice, because uh, this activity, the primary purpose is not to produce generalizable knowledge. It is to produce local knowledge specific to the individual patient. Uh, the use of randomization and the use of the term trial uh, invokes the uh, major reaction in the RBs. So typically, uh, most RBs consider this to be research, and that's uh, under full RB review. And uh, the only investigative group we know of is, uh, that was able to get an exemption from the regulation is uh, a Sunita Volos group at the University of Alberta. Uh, that's the issue I think that really has to be addressed. You know, HHS is, HHS is uh, uh, working on revamping the entire common rules. Uh, and uh, 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 I, I think the purpose is to try to avoid uh, overburdening regulations on low-risk uh, 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 activities. And I'm hope, hoping that if us uh, N1 trials could be classified as quality improvement instead of uh, human subject research, uh, it would make it much easier for practitioners to do it. All right, well, please join me in uh, thanking all the speakers for this afternoon. All right, now uh, Sebastian and uh, Scott will have a closing. So, so very briefly, thank you, everyone. This has really been a wonderful two days of presentations, and I hope you all have enjoyed it as much as I have. I want to be kind to our speakers because actually their work is just beginning as we um, put together the journal supplement. Everyone will be invited to um, submit their papers uh, for peer review in the journal supplement. We are in sort of final negotiations with a couple of journals. We haven't... Uh, sign the contract yet. It'll either be a clinical epidemiology journal or a health services research journal, and we hope by the end of the month to have that um, tied up. Also, um, wanted to uh, tell you that we've secured funding to have uh, at least one more conference symposium next year, so we are in the initial planning stages of what that will be. Um, we're working with the National Institutes of Health, specifically with NCATS, which is the 
I guess the newest center at NIH, National Center for Advancing Translational Soci uh, Sciences, the home of the CTSA program. So as you um, are thinking about this conference and um, looking towards the future, we would very much appreciate your input. Liz sent around an evaluation at noon, so in your mailboxes when you get home, if you haven't checked it already, there will be a, a very brief survey and we'd very much appreciate um, some feedback about how this conference went and then also your ideas about um, next year's conference. We'll have a, a probably a pretty big focus on rare diseases, which is a thematic area that we haven't covered in the past um, six years of the conference, but that also leaves a wide um, variety of topics yet to, to go with. So um, look at your emails, and we'd appreciate you if, um, to provide those um, feedback. Lastly, as I mentioned in the open remarks, our um, new best practice guide or user guide for developing CER protocols will be published in a couple months. So look to that, and I hope that is a resource for you um, and as you think about designing new studies for CER. And with that, Sebastian, would you like to say anything? <laughs> so uh, with, with that, uh, we will uh, close this session and uh, safe travels to everyone back to wherever where you're headed. So thank you.